Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start thanking um, the organizers for inviting me. Um, comments are welcome, please, and you can interrupt me if you want. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, at the statistics department at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And this work was joint work with uh, Renata Bueno, which was my PhD student that finished a couple of years ago. And uh, Alexandra Smith, which is, she's working now in McHill University in Canada. Um, I'm going to talk about modeling of uh, spatial temporal processes. And I'm interested mainly in non-Gaussian processes. Okay, so the focus of this work and the work I've been doing since my master degree is on non-Gaussian distributions. So I've been dealing with uh, student T, uh, hyperbolic, uh, this bardoff nielsen kind of dis distributions. And now I'm working with these applications in, in space-time data. So I'm focused here on um, heavier tails distributions. Okay, so that's the focus. Should I? Okay. So I'm going to present the model, the spatial temporal process, and the problems related to this kind of application. Um, I'll give an idea of the model that we proposed. Um, in my thesis, which was um, in two, back in 2010, and some extensions that I've been doing with these students after that. And I'll just comment, for example, with an example in data transformation, why we shouldn't be doing like log transformations and things like that. And I'll give you an illustration in temporal, temperature data analysis. So the typical problem, we have data observed in a finite number of locations and time points, but we actually want to predict in new points, S0, T0, so a new coordinate. And this could be any point in the domain of interest. So the, the domain is continuous here, so we observe um, a finite number of points and we want to predict anywhere. Um, so uh, to, to predict in, in any place, we think the best way is to uh, model this Z here as a process. So it's a random function of S and T in the domain of interest. I give here some, an example, some examples of applications. So for example, I could be modeling wind speed. And this is actually a, pro, a, a project I have now where we are studying the eolic power that we have in Brazil, in some regions in Brazil. And for that, we want to predict uh, new places for installing turbines, uh, turbines uh, so that we can have the best of the power we have, right? So we have to ideally identify regions where we have the best wind power and then install the turbine there. Yeah? Don't find that place. That's where I am. Ah, okay. <laughs> so this data um, I analyzed back there in my PhD thesis, and it is from Ireland. And they had 11 stations, and they wanted to predict the best place to install a new station to, to uh, produce wind power. Okay? And this is the, the mean uh, over the years. At this data, we had like 10 years of daily observations. So it's quite a lot of data. And this is another example that I'm going to present later. Here I have temperature data. And I have here all the time series, and here are the location, so it's the Basque country. And we also want to predict, to have a map, a field in the region of interest over time. So we want to predict the, the map in the future, for example. Okay, so that's the, the goal. 
So the general model for that problem would be to have this the uncertainty uh, modeled as a, um, a process Z of space and time. And to define this process, we could think about the mean function and the covariance function. And in this, in this context, it's very uh, important to define well the covariance function. So when you predict, even if you are talking about simple methods as Kriging, you usually use the correlation. So if you have the, the first law of ge geography that says that if you, are, you have things that are together, they should be more similar than things that are far apart. So we want to use this idea. And the main tool that we have is the correlation, the covariance function, right? So if you want to predict if this is the goal, you should model well the covariance, right? Um, and if you go a bit further and make more assumptions, you could think about the Gaussian process. So that's very common in practice. So in every audience, if you are talking, not, I'm not talking about just the spatial temporal data. If you are talking of most of any data, you usually think about the Gaussian distribution, right? So that's the the first, because it's really easy to use, all the moments and marginal and conditional distributions are easy to obtain analytically, right? And it usually it coincides with uh, optimization methods, even in regression we can prove that, right? So it's very convenient. Um, but there are situations where this shouldn't be done, right? We shouldn't be assuming Gaussianity for all kinds of applications. So here I have again the wind data. And what I did here, I fit, fitted uh, a model for each location. So I had a time series model. Okay. And after that, I estimated all the parameters. And here I have the variance. Here I have the reach, the, the range that I have in time. They are quite similar. And here I have the, um, I can see here. Here I have another parameter. Oh, here is the smoothness in time and here is the range. Okay, so I have the two parameters for each time series. As you can see, the variance is not the same for all the stations. You have that uh, in the coastal sites, uh, you have uh, variances that differ from the inland um, variances. Okay, so that's, that's uh, very common as well to happen. Uh, in the case of temperature data, you usually have this kind of behavior. Here I have fitted a Gaussian process uh, to, to the data with a mean function depending on covariates, for example, altitude. You know that you have higher altitudes, you have smaller temperatures, so it's okay, it's very common as well. But after that, if you look at the residuals of this fit, you still have this kind of relation. Here I have the empirical variance and the altitude. So this is also very common, right? If you have higher altitudes, you have larger variance. Okay? You can see that with prices of houses as well. The larger the house, larger the variance of the data. So what we are proposing here is that we could also model the variance as a process that depends on covariates. So instead of complicating too much the model, we just say that we have a mixture a scale mixture, but this mixture has to be chosen very carefully, so we need to define a process uh, with, respecting all the conditions, Kolmogorov conditions, etc. And after that, we can make this other process, the variance process, depend on covariates. Okay. So for instance, you could have um, several variables uh, measured in a, in a certain position, and if you have the wind in one di direction, you could have more correlation between them. So the, the direction of the wind could be a covariate to explain covariance 
right? This is also very intuitive. Um, so our proposal will be to include covariates in the covariance process. As a result, we have that the covariance will depend on the covariates. Okay, so we have, you can have more covariance if there is this wind flow in one direction, for example, or less covariance between variables. Okay. Um, another effect of this modeling is that for each location, you have one time series, and for each location, you could have different tails. So you could have more extremes in one region than in other region. And I'm not talking about the mean, I'm talking about fat tails. So different regions could have different kurtosis in the marginal distributions. Okay? So a simple extension, that's not the one I'm proposing, it's just something that I could do that's very simple, is to make the variance depending on the covariate directly. Okay? And the, mo the model would still be Gaussian. I'm not cha changing the sampling distribution, I just have different variances for each point. This model is not flexible enough. Uh, as locations with large variances, we usually have neighbors observation with large variances as well. So we are talking about modeling the variance as a smooth process. So that if you have observations that are close together, they shouldn't have very different variances. Okay? And this model would not give this flexibility to us. Because this is just, um, it's not correlated in the locations. They are just independent model, models and they depend just on the covariate. That's the only gain we get. Um, okay, so why do we need to have correlated processes for the variance? Because if you want to make prediction close to one location that you have data, you want the variance in this prediction to be similar to the one you had in the observer data. Okay, so it has to be smooth as well. Um, so uh, our main goals are to consider scale mixture of Gaussian process. So it's also what we do with some models in statistics. We have conditional independence given the parameters. Here I'm, I'm, I'm assuming conditional Gaussianity given the variance. Okay, so it's still Gaussian if you consider the variance as given to you. If not, you integrate the variance process, and then you get fat tails in this other process. Um, and what we have extra here, that was the project of this student, was to include the covariates in, the, in this variance process, so that we have dependence also in the covariance. That I, I told you already. Um, so the Gaussian models are us usually used mostly because they are very convenient. When you think about a process, you have to define in the, ca in the case of Gaussian processes just the mean function and the covariance function. This is very convenient. And all distributions are known and several methods were proposed to, to handle uh, issues that you find in real data analysis. For example, non-stationarity. You can use Gaussian models to find non-stationary non models, right? Or to handle larger data. So you have all these processes that are approximations that you do for very large data. You can do it very efficiently, uh, computationally efficient. Everything is done assuming Gaussian processes. So what, what if you don't have Gaussian process? If you, it's not the best fit, what do you do? Then um, we want, in this case, to accommodate fat tails, extremes. So when you are looking at uh, eolic power, for example, ideally you want to look at winds that are greater than seven meters. Uh, it's uh, seven meters per second, right? So. Uh, it's not, uh, you have extremes very often, 
you, you want to have extremes. So it's, uh, and more than that, you want to measure it well because um, if you install a turbine that's not projected for very large winds, it will break. So you just invest a lot of money in a turbine that's not going to work well because the winds are too, too, too fast or too, too high for, for what it, it's projected for. So uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, cost as well. So we want to predict it well. And predict the extreme extremes in this case is important. We also want to deal with skewness. I'm not do talking about this in this talk, but we have a proposal as well that's a skewed process that deals with the, the issue of skewness. That's not what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so what happens if you, ha if you have outliers or regions with large variance? So it's very common in spatial data that you have a certain region with larger variance. And what happens in this case if you are using the Gaussian process? Um, I'm going to give you an, an illustration of the effect of that. So here I have just 30 locations and 30 time points. I simulated data in this region, okay? And what I did, I just selected one location randomly and added an increment, a random increment. And this was the location seven here, okay? And what, what happens if, if I use Gaussian models to predict with this data? Well, this is uh, the correlation function, okay? that I would get, estimate, from the data if I had not contaminated with outliers, if it was the original data, okay? The first one without adding the increment. So this is kind of the true, the best I can get from data. This is the correlation I estimate if I use the contaminated data. Just one observation, okay? It's just one outlier. And that's the correlation I would use to make predictions, to interpolate and make a map. So this is not right, okay? This would get very bad results. This is what I get from the model that I'm proposing, and this is the true, so it's really, really similar. Just because the tails are well modeled, so it allows for an outlier in the data. Okay, so I'm not talking about estimating the mean. The mean are usually very well estimated in both models, okay, but the uncertainty, the, the predictive distribution will be very different. And if I'm predicting using this kind of methods, usually it depends on the correlation. And the correlation here is totally wrong with the Gaussian process, okay. So how do we do non-Gaussian modeling in this case? Um, uh, there are several proposals. For example, uh, something similar to the Box-Cox transformation, you could try to transform the data. That's very usual as well. In time series, you usually do log returns or you just take the log transformation and assume that you have Gaussianity afterwards. Um, you can come up with a method to select the transformation, okay? It's, it's easy to do. The thing is, I'm going to show with an example here, that when you transform the data, you also transform the kind of relations that you have. And even if you had before a Gaussian process, when you take the log, the covariance will now depend on the mean function, right? So you create a monster. When you had mean and covariance, you transform the data, taking the log, and then you have a covariance that depends on the mean. If the mean is very complicated, the covariance will be true, right? So taking the log seems simple, but you are changing the kind of relations that you have in the data. Um, so there are some papers dealing with that. This paper from Bolin, 2014, is using SPDs to come up with some non-Gaussian noise. So you can come up with uh, uh, develop a new model from these SPDs, and they work very well. It's a different proposal. 
There is this other proposal, that's the one I'm following. It's a paper from 2006 from Mark Steele, that was my supervisor. And this is an extension that we did to do, he did it just in a space, and it's a very simple model. Then we extended it to allow for different kind of behaviors and also time. So we are there we are dealing with time and space at the same time. Uh, so what we are doing here is just a scale mixture. The usual ones that you do to obtain, for example, the student sheet distribution. Okay, just a scale mixture. Uh, and the model is able to accommodate sp spatial heterosedasticity, uh, heavy tails, which the Gaussian noise will not. Uh, as I said, this is the example of the log transformation, where the covariance function after taking the log will now depend on the mean. Okay, so that's, that's a fact. Uh, so how do you do the scale mixture? Um, well, we have here the mean function. I'm writing it as just a regression. And then I have sigma times the Gaussian process, epsilon. And then I divide it by lambda, by uh, square root of lambda. Um, so the thing is, this lambda here, if it's one, you get back to Gaussian, okay? But if it's not one, if it's small, then it inflates the variance. And this is done for each point in space, anywhere in the space. Um, where else? Well, this uh, lambda has to be a process, has to be correlated. Because if it's not correlated, when you get close together, you don't get similar variances. So you don't get smooth processes on the resulting Z. Okay, any discontinuity that you have in lambda will go through Z. So we have to assume at least that this process here, lambda, is uh, mean square continuous. Then all the differentiability properties of, of epsilon will be reflected in Z. Okay, um, so this is the condition I was talking about. So when we have uh, S going to S, uh, to a different location, if they are getting together, then we have to have this, these expectations here, um, tending to this uh, expectation here. So that's what I said. Um, so we need to correlate to these variables. One way to do it is to assume that we have a common variable. Lambda of S is equal to lambda. And if you do that and you say that you have a gamma distribution, then you have the student T process. That's the simplest way to do it. Okay, but it's not flexible enough, enough because what we're doing when you do that, you say that in space, you have a fixed lambda, just one lambda. You don't have one for each location. And remember that what I want is if I have a time series, I want the tail to be different in each location. So if I, I am in a higher place, I want to have more extremes, so I want to have m higher kurtosis, right? If I'm in, in the level of the sea, I want to have a smaller kurtosis, maybe the Gaussian one, okay? So you can have this changing with location if you want. So the student T process is not able to do it. So when you think that you are being robust or doing something more flexible doing student -y processes, you are not. At least in space-time space applications, it doesn't do what it should, okay? So what we do is a bit more general than student -y processes. What we do, we are going to say that the, pro the process is a Gaussian log a Gaussian. So the lambdas will be log a Gaussian. Okay, so log of lambda is for a finite number of locations, we have a multivariate normal distribution. And it will depend on this parameter ni here that says the following. In one location, the expected value of lambda is one. So it's the Gaussian process, okay? I go back to the Gaussian process. And if, if it is, this parameter grows, then I have the variance of lambda growing as well, 
And the kurtosis will be three times the exponential of this parameter. So when it grows, the tails will be heavier. Okay, this for each location and each time point. Now, here I'm talking about the process that of S and T. So this parameter is going to control the tail behavior of the process. Here, um, I'll just comment on that. The covariance function that I'm using for the variance process is the same as the epsilon. This is just, uh, it's kind of arbitrary. You could do it different. If you have many uh, locations and time points, you have information to estimate both. And they are different. I've done some empirical studies where for several applications, I've tried to use different covariance for the, the epsilon and the variance, and they were estimated different. Okay, so they are different processes. Here I'm going to present the results with the same one. Here, just another illustration. If you have the same kind of study where you contaminated data, here I contaminated neighbors. So it's in this direction that you have a region where you have inflated variance for some reason. So you could model that with a non-stationary model, something more complicated. But maybe conditionally on the variance, it's just Gaussian. It's just a simple model. That's what we are doing. And we get similar results. Here is the covariance you get if you don't do anything with the data. It's just the, the original data. Okay. This is what you get from the Gaussian model. And that's what we get with this mixture model. Just because we are able to accommodate these outliers. Okay. Even more if they are correlated. Like in this one, they are neighbors. Right. Um, so you, this is also a tool to identify the outliers. So once you have the lambdas, you know the variances, and you can compute which ones have the larger variances. And these ones are the outliers, the ones that are here. Here is just the posterior distribution of these parameters. And here is the kurtosis. Okay, so it's different from the one in the Gaussian model. The thing is, in this first model that I showed you, the kurtosis is different from the Gaussian one, but unconditional on lambda is still fixed. Okay? If you integrate lambda, then you still get the same variance, the same uh, kurtosis. It's fixed. Uh, what we do now, once you incorporate the covariates in the variance process, you have one for each location because it depends on the covariates. Okay, so if you, ha you have higher altitudes, you can have fatter tails. Okay, that's what we wanted with this application, with uh, the temperature data. So how do you include covariates? There are many ways to do it. Uh, we are following this approach here of uh, Neto, Gutorp, and others, where they use the direction in the covariance function to, to in, in the modeling of wind. So the direction was used to explain co correlation when you are trying to explain uh, to model wind. Okay, so it's, um, and it works very well. So that's the kind of approach we are taking. And here, as I said, this parameter new is the one controlling the tails. So we just make kind of a regression with this parameter where we put the covariates depending, um, influence, influencing this, uh, this new. So now log of new is just a regression on covariates. You can use as many as you want. Even the same ones that you put in the mean, you can put in the covariance. Okay, so you can use the same covariates. And I'll show you with the example, the effects are different. For example, with the temperature, you know that in the mean you have higher altitudes, you have lower temperature. On the other hand, if you have higher altitudes, you have higher variances. So the effects are opposite in sign. Right, one is positive dependence, the other one is negative. Um, so this will be non-stationary because it depends on the covariates which are 
in each point in space. So it's, it's a non-stationary model. And uh, we get different marginal distributions. Okay, so you, you have here the Courtois is now depending on these covariates. That's what we wanted. Um, what else? Have some, at least you have some time. 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, so how do you do predictions? So Gaussian models are very useful and very convenient because you know how to do predictions very easily. Well, now here we do the same. So conditional on lambda, which are latent, latent variables, you just use Gaussian predictions, okay, the usual ones. So lambdas are estimated in my uh, scheme, my sampling scheme, so it's conditional on lambda. Okay, so this, this, the predictions are the same. How do I compare performance? How do, do, I, do I know that the Gaussian distribution is worse than this non-Gaussian distribution? I'm using here proper score rules, the LPS, the log predictive score. So it's based on the predictions, on the predictive distribution. Or interval score, so if you have the credible interval of the predictive distribution as your best guess, then you can check whether you are doing well or not when you observe the data. So you just remove some data to do some validation and you check how you're doing. Um, about the prior distribution, in this case here is like a modeling tool. We are actually using informative distributions in the sense that we want to represent re real um, real processes like uh, temperature or wind, we want to be realistic. And we know that a kurtosis of 20 is not realistic. So we have an up upper bound for the kurtosis that we allow in the fitting so that we don't overfit. Because if you have an outlier that's very different from the others, if you allow the model to have a very high kurtosis, you just get it very high. Okay, so the intervals will be huge and will not represent real data. What we do, we limit the prior so that we don't have kurtosis that don't make sense in this application. Okay, so here is what we get from the Gaussian process. This, this is just a simulation of a marginal at one site with one height. What would we get for the Gaussian distribution? What we would get with a fatter tail distribution just using new and the covariate with a, um, a certain value. And here is what we get if you allow the Courtois to be too, low, too, too high. Okay, so it's just very different from the Gaussian. We don't want to go that far from the Gaussian. We want some flexibility, but we don't want unrealistic be behaviors. We don't want to overfit. Um, here I have some synthetic data, some simulated data with uh, the log transform, just to show you how it behaves if you do the log transform. I'll just skip a bit. Um, so in this case, here I'm showing uh, the effect of altitude in the covariance. So you have here the effect I use it two different priors, okay, dependent or independent, just two different kinds, just to have some sensibility. And you see that the parameter is very, very uh, significant, different from zero. So we are not getting back to Gaussianity. This is because the data was simulated taking the log transform. So we are inducing this dependence on the altitude. Okay, so I know, this is simulated data, that I have this dependence on, on altitude. And I don't know what kind of uh, dependence is that, right? So it's a very non-linear relation. But then I just do my regression in the covariance, and I get this, this posterior for, for the coefficient. So it's very significant. Altitude is very useful to explain the covariance. And here I have the performance. That's what I get if I don't use altitude. So here is just the predictions against the observed and the intervals, the predictive intervals. And you see that you just miss the higher values just because you are not considering the information of altitude. If you do consider, then you get right the results about large values, okay, that's, 
these are the places we have the higher altitudes and the, the larger cortoses. Well, all these methods of comparison, uh, interval score or log predictive score, indicate that our model does better than not considering covariates. Okay. Uh, now, just uh, quickly, I'll talk about the temperature data, where we clearly have this dependence between variance and altitude. Okay, this is clear. Even after this graph was obtained after fitting a Gaussian model with the altitude in the mean. Okay, so I'm already considering altitude in the mean. It's, it doesn't help to, to solve this kind of behavior. So the effect in the mean, as I said, is here. So it's negative for all models. Here I have all the models, Gaussian, uh, non-Gaussian, and non-Gaussian dependent, independent. And as you see, all the effects are negative, as I expect, and very different from zero. And now if I do it in the covariance, in the variance, I have this positive effect. So higher the altitude, higher the variance. Um, if it was zero, I would get back to the first model, the mixture model, which doesn't depend on covariates. Okay. So it's the, the first one that I showed you. And if, if I, in, the, in this other model, I had the beta naught estimated as, um, as zero, then I would have back the Gaussian process. So we, we have ways to, to go back to both the models, just the Gaussian or the non-Gaussian without covariates. So it's useful. Um, we also fitted this simple model that has different variances depending uh, on altitude. So it's very simple to do that, right? So as you see, it behaves very similar to the Gaussian process while our model is able to reduce a lot the predictive score. It's more, it's less than half, right? And here, just doing the variance value with, with altitude, you don't, cha you don't change anything. It's just because we're, what we are saying is that the effect of this uh, variance changing with altitude is also influencing the, the covariance, right? So that's why this happens. These measures are all predictive, so they depend a lot on the correlation. And as I said, you can get, like here, the, the, the Gaussian process miss the higher values, while the non-Gaussian models can predict well these higher values, just because it depends on altitude. We are using this information. Just to conclude, uh, we introduced this new class of models and we try to be flexible to allow for different variances and um, different covariances depending on these covariates. And this implies that for each point in space, I have a time series that can have a different tail behavior. Uh, that's uh, what we think is very useful and very intuitive. Um, we didn't focus on the time modeling. So if you go back to the first uh, model that I presented uh, with the mixture, uh, I just put there the, the lambda in space, okay? Here, the lambda is just in indexed in space. In my, uh, pre in, uh, in my proposal, in my thesis, I do it in space and time together. So you can also have volatility model for the time series together with heterogeneity, uh, heterosedasticity modeling in space. So you do the two things. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you.